Trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative. Fantastic. Well, let's get into it. I mean, last FOMC meeting last week, uh, yesterday, I'm sorry. And there was a surprise, even though you didn't think there could be a surprise. It's like, all right, unchanged, 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 you know, QT the same. There was a surprise, very dovish surprise, wasn't there? Very much a change of rhetoric from uh, Jay Powell in that press conference. Uh, and that was li that was fun listening to. And, and of course, today there was a contrast with uh, Christine Lagarde. Uh, who is not nearly as dovish with the European Central Bank. But, uh, you know, Jay Powell has to deal with the, what we call the dot plots, but the economic forecast from all the different FOMC members. And they were, uh, you know, getting much more encouraging about inflation coming down and so forth. And that's the reality of his committee. It's not by no means the unanimous, but the consensus had moved. And so his rhetoric needed to get in line with what people were seeing. And so, you know, when I looked at that dot plot, which is every other week, right? Every other meeting, right? Every other meeting, they do the summary of economic predictions. And when I went through it from Fed funds targets all the way through unemployment and all the categories they covered, it almost seemed like it almost seemed like soft landing Goldilocks kind of estimates across the board. Well, that's what they're going to say. Um, you got to remember, there are 17 uh, people that are in the dot plots all the FOMC members and the uh, Board of Governors, with with only one or two exceptions, these people were not career forecasters, <laughs> okay? I mean, Jay Powell was a lawyer. He was in private equity, things like that. But, uh, but they have staff. You know, all the regional feds and the board have staff, and they have some really great economists. But by and large, none of those economists have had trading experience. You're not allowed to trade if you work for the Fed, okay? <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I think that uh, Jay Powell and, and Christine Lagarde couldn't say it enough today that they're data dependent, and which means that they don't trust their forecast. Uh, and so what that also means is when they have to make forecasts, uh, you know, they're going to be kind of what's politically acceptable. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of cover, I would say. I would say. Yeah. So, but anyway, kind of a surprise. Equity markets went crazy. Uh, you know, exceeded expectations. You know, Santa Claus rally is kicking in right now. We're still making new highs as we're talking right now. But let's kind of dig into the data a little bit going into that. I know uh, I want to kind of pop up a, a, a chart that you sent me, which was interesting. And you, you're talking about PCE core inflation um, in relationship to the Fed funds rate. Right. Um, the Fed targets PCE core inflation. That's their favorite number. <clears throat> It's been their favorite number for decades. Uh, when they chose it way back, I don't know, 80s or somewhere, um, it was kind of an interesting choice because at the time it was generally believed to be the inflation index that would always show the lowest amount of inflation. <laughs> uh, that hasn't always been true. Um, 
but it's a, it's a reasonably good number. It's, uh, you know, it's hovering down there close to 3%. Now we'll get some numbers on that at the end of December and so forth. Uh, but the Fed funds rate is comfortably above it. Um, there's no consensus of economists about how high Fed funds has to be above the inflation rate to be restrictive. But most economists, if you're 1% or more above the inflation rate, you're restrictive. So uh, the Fed's actually got room um, to cut a little bit, even um, if the core inflation doesn't get to two. Well, so just looking at this chart here, it it begs with the question, at least for me, is going forward here, uh, are we entering into a longer term period where the Fed funds rate, this, there's, it's always going to be at a premium above the PCE core by a certain amount, right, going forward here? Will that kind of parallel out? Yes, a little bit, not without some significant volatility. Um, prior to 2008, uh, like if you take it from the Volcker days all the way to uh, 2008, you'll see that the Fed funds rate averaged above the inflation rate. And the only exceptions typically were a couple of quarters around deep recessions. The 1990 SNL crisis, a little bit around 9-11, uh, in 2001. But by and large, the Fed really wanted to keep rates above the inflation through, I, I should say not 2008, but through 2002 or 2004. Uh, Greenspan took things down to 1%. Uh, and then Bernanke took thing after 9-11 and, and Greenspan took it, not Greenspan, sorry, Bernanke took it to zero. That changed, you know, and I think we're going to jettison that era of, of hyper- accommodative policy. So the Fed may still lower the Fed funds below the rate of inflation in a recession, particularly a serious one like 2008. But um, for the most part, I think we're looking at a period where 90% of the time Fed funds are going to be above the core rate of inflation. And that kind of makes sense to me a little bit, just from a management point of view, if anything else. Um, but I, this is a great chart. I appreciated that. I'm going to kind of move, let's move a little bit forward here. Um, Cause when we talk about uh, you know, we're talking about recession, right? Are we going to go into a recession or whatever a soft landing is or no landing? I don't even know the <laughs> definition of these things, but um, this is pretty interesting chart right here. Yeah. I mean, this is the fastest rate increase <clears throat> since 1980, 81. Uh of course, Jay Powell tried to increase rates uh, in 2017, 2018, and they got started. And the equity market had a serious bear market uh, move, and the Fed got got scared, or uh, at least ca cautious, and they took it away. And then when the pandemic hit, they completely took it away, went back to zero. Uh, but this time is real, and I think they learned something from that 2018. The economy was actually doing fine in 2018 and 2019. It didn't respond to interest rates then. The unemployment rate was at four or less. So, uh, you know, but this is a pretty fast rate increase. But I do think the economy is considerably less interest rate sensitive than it used to be. So that means the Fed has less power to uh, treat the U.S. economy like a stereo system. I, I, I you know. They, is it, well, but is this, a, is this a, a paradigm shift, you think, or a temporary shift? Oh, no, this has been going on for decades. And anything that goes on for decades is very hard for uh to, to be recognized. I mean, you know, you can sit out there and watch paint dry and it will dry, but you're going to be bored. And, you know, and you can watch grass grow in the same thing. Well, in this case, the U.S. economy has been drifting away in, in the 50s and 60s. We were a manufacturing housing led economy, no doubt about it. And both of those are very, uh, when you raise interest rates, housing and autos and anything you borrow money for can get hurt pretty bad. If that's driving the economy, you're going to be more interest rate sensitive. But, you know, we're now a service economy. doesn't mean that interest rate increases aren't important, but they don't hit the economy nearly as hard, hit a service economy nearly as hard. They do hit assets, equity prices, house prices, bond prices. They respond big time to interest rate changes. So my comments are only about the real economy being less sensitive. So, all right, I'm going to just... I, I'm just going to throw a little bit of a curveball here. Was was this morning's retail sales number surprising to you? 
You know, those numbers move around a lot. So uh, I, I I don't think it was all that surprising, uh, given the, the moves possible. But, you know, we're, uh, we're, you know, you cut through average things out. We're OK. All right. Well, that's good. To, that's good to know. Um, let's keep moving here. Um, you gave me so much good content uh, before we started here. Uh, we're going to kind of we're going to chip away uh, through some of this. And we've been talking about the yield curve a lot. The yield curve, I think, uh, you know, I'm following the um, CME Group's uh, micro yield contracts. And we kind of look at the two and 10 as a inversion uh, level. Is that the right is, is that the right mix? The two and 10 is certainly my favorite um, one to look at. You won't get all of that much different information. There are people that look at the three month T-bill against the 10. They look at the one year against the 10. You're going to get more or less the same answer, whichever one you look at. Uh, and, you know, you're just looking to see how long the one and two year stay elevated over the 10 year. Uh, and that certainly has started to uh, to change a little bit, but it, it won't change big time until the Fed actually does its thing. Well, we were tracking, you know, we were we were tracking a tightening into the the 20 something basis point range between the 10 and two. And then we popped back up recently into the high four, you know, 45, 47 basis points. Now we're going, now we're now, now after yesterday, we're, we're going in the right direction. It seems like. Well, we had a couple of things happen when the yield curve first inverted and it really wasn't definitively inverted till around November of 2022. Uh, that was all short-term rates going higher. I mean, mostly the bond yields were going up too, but the short-term rates were really going up. And then more recently this year, you know, we had a we the 10 year hit 5 percent and then we had an incredible rally. And now we're down at 4 percent or you know, slightly below. Yeah. Uh, so that's the yield curve uh, until, you know, that's coming from the back end. The front end is what the Fed controls and the back end is what the market controls. So uh kind of have to watch what's causing the yield curve inversion. But, you know, again, we don't typically get a recession until 18 months or so after the yield curve inverts. So if you're counting, that's uh, sometime second, third quarter next year. Uh, but I, you know, I'm in the camp that I, I don't see it. My base case is not a recession. Okay. Well, that, that's interesting. You know, I remember, you know, I was in a 30-year bond pit in yesteryear, I mean, so many years, decades ago, I can't even tell you. But um, by the bond, the thirty-year bond prices were trading at a, at a discount below a hundred, right? And that blows everyone's mind now. Well, you know, we were 1981, 82, 83, right? And now, um, and now that I, when I look at a ten-year uh, treasury, uh, uh, your prices on ten-year treasuries, I see a distinct bottom that uh, from a, from a couple of weeks ago that might be a bottom for a long period of time. Yeah, the bottom you're seeing in uh, in prices is the five percent yield uh, period, and and if inflation stays even at three percent, even three and a half percent, that five percent's got a very good chance of being a, a ceiling on the yield, or in the, your case, the price is a floor. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. There's some nice cars here on your chart. Let's. Uh, all right. So this is the punchline. We. <laughs> Hang on, let's go. We can go back. We can have a little bit of fun. This is uh, what do we got here? We're looking at uh, you're looking a at a '57 Chevy with a huge V8 engine, guzzling gas like crazy. This is a symbol of when GM drove the economy, and that's of course no longer true. Uh, by the way, back in the '50s and '60s and '70s, there were no um, interest rate futures, so you couldn't even hedge your interest rate exposure. Okay, so things were a little bit more locked in. By the way, this is this is a work of art. By the way, <laughs> it um, is a work of art. And if you need parts for it, you got to go to Havana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, now the paradigm's changed, right? I think you had some bullet points on the right. It says, "Hey, everything's a little bit different now. Different kind and of economy." So you're, yeah, electric vehicles. We're not. We're a service economy, technology economy. And by the way millions upon millions of interest rate futures contracts trade hands every day uh interest rate hedging interest rate risk management there's not a financial institution that doesn't do it uh and so uh you know the, every time is the more interest rate risk management is effective in the economy you know that that pendulum swings a little bit away from the fed's ability 
you know, a, a change in interest rate doesn't have the same impact because the banks are at least partly hedged. Not all banks, but, not all financial institutions, okay. but some of them. But that, that does, doesn't that take some of the pressure off then? Because now the institutions are managing themselves to get out of whatever the trend is. Well, it only takes pressure off the Fed if they agree with that argument and they haven't produced any research to suggest that they're uh, on board. In fact, they typically use models that uh, embody uh, interest rate labor market trade offs that uh, that haven't existed for 20 years. So that's uh, they haven't really come around on a research standpoint to to the view I'm expressing. OK, so let's kind of let's, let's move into the next category. Let's get to personal consumption uh, right now, which seems to be still pretty darn strong. Well, personal consumption is two thirds of GDP. So, I mean, if personal consumption is OK, you're going to be OK, because the other parts, government is, you know, it's going to do what it does. It's not going to shrink. Uh, it might not grow. Inventories are just a quarter to quarter volatility thing. So this is really the key to forecasting GDP. And uh, the key to personal consumption is jobs. If you got a job, you spend money. But if your neighbor loses their job, you worry about yours. If some friend in your family, a cousin or something loses their job, you start worrying a lot more about yours. And then, of course, if you lose yours, you're really worried about your job. Uh, so jobs are, 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 are absolutely critical to the sentiment around whether you're spending money or not. So going back to the dot plot, you know, we're, one of the categories on the dot plot was was unemployment. And it, it, it did suggest to tick up into the mm-hmm. fours, but not much past that. Yeah, and even that's not going to be that easy um, to, a, <laughs> I shouldn't say it quite like that, but the labor force is not growing very rapidly. And the and basically the only, re, the ra- labor force shrunk during the pandemic, but it's come back and participation has come back. But now the growth of the labor force from here on out is going to be pretty slow. That's the denominator of the unemployment rate. So if the denominator is growing slow, the numerator doesn't have to grow that fast to keep it the same. Uh, so we can slow down job growth and still stay at 4% unemployment. Okay. But well, and that's so- too technical with my arithmetic there. No, no, no. I like the numerator denominator. We're breaking new ground here. So, <laughs> but also by, by the same token, the GDP in the dot plot, I didn't see a negative, a negative quarter. Well, you don't, you don't have, you wouldn't have one. Um, if, if the job market started growing at say 50,000 job payroll jobs a month, uh, you wouldn't <coughs> need to have a, a negative GDP quarter. And again, as I mentioned before, these are not professional forecasters that much that are signing off, even though they have a good staff. Um, you would tend to do a smooth one. Nobody wants to get, oh, you know, the third quarter is going to be negative, but not the fourth the next year. I mean, all you're going to do is be wrong on that. So why do it? Is that still the definition of, of recession, two quarters negative? Depends on who you ask. If you ask the uh, pundit on the street or maybe in the media, two quarters is a really good rule of thumb. If you ask the National Bureau of Economic Research that actually officially sets recession dates, they do not use that rule. And they will tell you that. And they haven't used it always in the past. 2001 was a recession year, 2001 and two, and we never got two quarters in a row of uh, down GDP. What the uh, NBER looks at more is they really want to know what real personal consumption is doing. They want to know how the consumer is feeling. If the consumer is hurting, they're going to call it a recession. If the consumer is still even growing just a little bit expenditures, they're going to they're not going to call a recession. But they're very much more judgmental than is realized. Oh, and they're also late. They'll tell you it's a recession a year after you already know you're in one. (laughs) <laughs> well, I Chair Powell said yesterday, he answered that question yesterday. He said, I, I do not believe we are in a recession right now. He, he did say that. Right. And I, I agree with that. I mean, we could have gotten a recession when Silicon Valley Bank went under, because if that had dominoed through the whole regional banking system and into the finance system, uh, that would have been the kind of thing that would have shaken up the system. Not maybe as bad as 2008, but not good. But the regulators uh, stopped that. They kept it from spreading. 
And uh, so that was our episode that could have been trouble. But right now, we've made it through some pretty big uh, labor market agreements and strikes that are over. Um, we've the supply chains are working pretty good. Uh, it's it's uh, you know we have commercial real estate problems, but those spread out over years. Those leases don't all come up on one day. You know they come up over ten years, and they get stretched out. And by the way, we all know about these problems. Uh, so they're already been priced into the market, and the market is certainly the equity market certainly not screaming recession here. Uh, so I, I think we can uh, have a pretty robust economy. One of my fundamental tenets in doing forecasting is that I really think policymakers and even a lot of uh, professional economists underestimate the resilience of the U.S. economy. We have a great system and it really does work and it's adaptable and flexible. And uh, I think, you know, this whole idea that the government needs to do something or the Fed needs to do something, eh, they don't always need to do it. They just give the economy a year and it'll be back. All right. Well, that's enc that's encouraging. I mean, I, <laughs> hopefully that's the case. I mean, let's. I just forwarded over to the job openings uh, slide, which I thought was interesting that you sent me earlier today, because this is kind of, I guess, if I was drawing a Fibonacci retracement, we're at about a thirty-eight percent retracement right now. Yeah, we're clearly off the uh, job opening levels that we were in the peak of the pandemic recovery period. Um, it's really fairly easy for companies to pull job openings. It's a lot easier to not hire than to fire. Uh, so this is the first stage of getting back to a more typical job market. But by the way, if you look at 2018, 2019 on this picture before the pandemic, that job market was actually extremely strong then. So your base case should really go back to 2015 or so to tell you what is more uh, more typical uh, of a you know an economy growing at say one and a half two percent real GDP. Um, yeah. So on the, on the flip side of that, we have you know jobless claims again came in today two hundred thousand something like that. I mean, it's just it can't. That the four-week moving average just can't can't even get to consensus month week over week. It, it seems to me um, <laughs> that 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 part of the employment situation, I'll call it, um, is pretty is pretty keen. It is fine. Uh, you do have to take a two-month holiday break here in December and January and not look at those jobs claims weekly numbers, uh, particularly the uh, the seasonal adjustment during December and January is phenomenally difficult. And I would argue almost impossible uh, because of the way holiday temporary employment works and all that. So I do not uh, look at the um, weekly unemployment claims uh, for a couple, until February again. I'm not sure you have a chart of those, uh, The uh, but it's uh, it would be in one of the spreadsheets, but they are very distorted at the end of December and early January due to holiday retail sales and things like that. So, uh, I mean, temporary help. And so just be careful with those weekly unemployment claims. They're unreliable for about eight more weeks. Okay, that's good. In that's good intel, and that makes sense, right? We, you know, we're we're ordering Christmas presents and holiday gifts and all, and going doing all that stuff with the family. And it's Keeping very hard to seasonally adjust those temporary employment folks that come on board and then leave. Yeah. So let let me let's talk about you know, this. Is a very common question that me and Tom Schneider get, and Michael Burke get on our you know our live shows in the morning and the afternoon. It's you know. Are we going to make all-time highs, new highs in equity markets? Are we not? And I'll be honest with you, two weeks ago, I thought, no way. Three weeks ago, I said, no way. Now, look at us. It's amazing. Well, you know, when you're when you're narrowing equity markets down, you, you're going to want to know what's the interest rate environment because that discounts your future cash flows. And you're going to want to know what your earnings outlook is. Right now, with the Fed uh, doing this change of rhetoric and change of the narrative, uh, what's the, the, the NASDAQ, which is tech heavy, tech heavy is growth heavy. Growth heavy means that your free cash flow is way out into the future. So it, it's an extremely sensitive sector for interest rates, but so is the S&P 500. Uh, so if interest rates come down, uh, you get an equity rally. But then once that rally's over, and, you know, plateaus, then you got to think, wow, you know, what are earnings growth going to look like over the next couple of years? Uh, 
And there, I think we're going to temper our enthusiasm a little bit because interest rates are likely to stay above the uh, inflation rate. We're not going to go back to zero rates and free capital and things like that. And so earnings will probably grow a little slower. And the pendulum, you know, from wages to capital has swung a little bit. So hourly wages may do fairly well here for the worker. And that may come out of corporate profits, not out of prices. So um, I'm optimistic about earnings growing, but I don't, they're much lower forecast for me than they were when rates were zero. So interestingly, the last couple of days, now the Russell 2000 small cap stock index, it, that's been, it's been the weak link, right? Of the three major right. ones we look at at the CME group. And, you know, it's been suggested to me that, well, there's 40% of these small caps are borrowers and very sensitive to interest rates. Well, the last two, two sessions, this is, I've never seen a happier stock index future. <laughs> yes, the Russell 2000 is a very happy index. Um, that's uh, the idea that if the Fed is going to start lowering rates, the economy w- can avoid a recession. And if we avoid a recession, these small companies in the U.S. can do very, very well. The, the Russell 2000 is a much more domestic index uh, the S&P 500, 40% of those cash flows are outside the country. And of course, the tech companies are global companies. So um, <clears throat> the Russell 2000 is really telling you, hey, lower interest rates are good. No recessions, even better. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. We'll see if that keeps moving up until the end of the, at least the month. Um, let's let's kind of pivot over to uh, the U.S. federal government expenditures. I pulled up the uh, this chart you sent me, which was very, very interesting. You could see that COVID peak in expenditures kind of settling back down. Um, and you're comparing it with receipts. Yeah, receipts are, uh, it's more than tax revenues, but it's every dollar the government gets. So it all counts, uh, driven by tax revenues. And the expenditures are every dollar the government spends pretty much. And uh, so, yeah, that pandemic was $5 trillion of fiscal stimulus uh, between uh, the President Trump and President Biden, uh, pretty, pretty heavy expenditures. Uh, and it was matched by $5 trillion of quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve to make sure there was no interest rate impact. And that's gone away, too, now that they're slowly shrinking the balance sheet, but they've raised rates. Um, so this is a pretty interesting chart that suggests that government spending expenditures is not going to grow much because the budget deficit sitting there at 6% and it, of GDP, and it might even get a little larger because guess what the fastest growing category of, inter- of uh, government expenditure is? Interest expense. Because yep. they're rolling off debt at uh, zero T-bills, 2%, you know, 3% debt, and if they're paying 4 and 5% for the new debt. So, uh, and of course, they're adding debt while they're at it. So, uh, you know, the interest expense is going to constrain all of the budget discussions. Um, so, but but on the debt side, what, you know, when once Fed funds start creeping down, whatever that pace is going to be, would it, wouldn't that kind of shift the focus of borrowing to the longer yields? Um, I don't. Oh, if the Fed funds rate ever yeah, if it starts coming down two or three times, I think people will start to think of corporations particularly will mm-hmm. will want to secure their financial future by by extending the the maturity of their debts. So yeah, I would I would agree with that. Okay. I got it. I found that I found the interest rate chart. <laughs> by the way, it's kind of a scary looking chart, to be honest with you. The interest well, expense chart. If it I I did a log scale on this chart with a log scale, the slope of the line actually is the growth rate. Uh, If I had not done a log scale, you would have been really scared because it would have shot through the roof. Um, But it is starting. You can see it starting to grow right there in a higher, faster growth rate in the last year. And that's that's not going to go away, even if they cut rates, because they're still refinancing a lot of stuff uh, that had three percent or lower rates in it. Well, wow. we have so much more great information we could cover. Unfortunately, we're up against time a little bit, but I do want to kind of ask you, you what, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, rate cuts going in through 2000? What's your dot plot for 2020? <laughs> well, I've been doing a lot of research on 
how accurate are Fed funds futures? And it's interesting research because uh, the Fed fund futures are highly accurate, particularly in the last 12 years or so, uh, in forecasting the next meeting. So, you know, and, and, and that makes sense because they have the, the uh, FOMC and the Fed doesn't like to surprise the market. Uh, so you kind of lock in about a month ahead and then the Fed doesn't want to surprise. So that's a good forecast. But then you say, well, how good is the Fed funds futures 18 months ahead? <laughs> okay, they're not any good at all, but we all know that. Um, they're, they're just putting the price on a risk management out 18 months. What, what do you need to do? Um, but it's also interesting that they tend to suggest when rates start going up or when rates start going down, Fed funds futures are typically a little late getting the timing and often do not capture the magnitude. And this seems to work in both directions. Uh, so if you believe that, uh, we might actually get four rate cuts next year. Well, let's take a peek at let's take a peek at the CME Group's <laughs> Fed Funds tool. I, this is I look at this the first thing in the morning. I, I I make a cup of coffee, and then I go here CME Fed Fund Fed Watch tool, and I just hit the refresh button. And this is that matrix that that you're talking about. And now we're pricing, what are we pricing? We're pricing um, a 68.7% chance that that cut's going to happen in March. Yeah, March 20 is the new um, the new dot plots. It's probably the, the meeting that's uh, now favored. If you had looked at this chart a week ago, it would have told you the first cut was coming on May 1st. So we, we've had a one meeting move. Uh, in, in how these expectations look. And if I follow the teal, the teal mm -hmm. squares all the way down, we're tracking uh, 375 to 400 basis points uh, for, by December. That's quite a, that's, that's a decent move. That's a decent move. And that's a pretty aggressive move. Um, I would say that that move probably suggests us that you've got to have a little bit of a slower economy to get the, for the Fed to move that fast. Yeah. When the economy goes into recession, the Fed will take the elevator down, okay? But if the economy, if the Fed is just focused on, um, on inflation, then they're gonna be using the stairs and they probably will even be willing to skip more than one meeting uh, on the way down just to make sure, because you know they had a credibility issue not understanding when the inflation took off in 2022. So as long as they don't have a recession, I think they'll be super cautious. Uh, but, you know, if you want to go down below 4% by the end of next year, you're probably talking a, a little bit of inflation and it's definitely more, uh, um, excuse me, improvement on inflation and definitely weaker economy. And of course, core PCE could throw a, mon a spanner in the works, as, as Eric would say. Yes, yes, that's lovely. Uh, the English English for wrench. <laughs> I know for sure. Well, Blue, thank thank you for your time today. Um, congratulations on the uh, uh, you know your milestone retiring from the CME after all those years. Um, I only wish I would have met you sooner. Yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll catch up again though in the new year in Charleston. I'm, ho <laughs> I'm hoping to get you back. I know. Yeah, we could do that anytime. And I'm, I'm hoping February first we'll see you to do a, a post-mortem on, uh, on the next FOMC. Oh, yeah. Jay Powell is going to have a lot to say at that meeting, too. Awesome. Well, listen, you have a great holiday. Again, thanks for being here with us. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. All right, everybody listening to today's show, greatly appreciate you being here today. Special edition to see the futures. And I just want to remind, remind everybody, most important message, folks, please be safe out there. Be good to each other. See you soon.